Hello, everybody, and welcome to our studio show. This weekend, we're at the MX2 Grand Prix of Thailand, and of course, uh, well, MXGP of Thailand as well. But uh, this weekend, my guests, Adam Wheeler from On Track Off Road, Julian Lieber from Standing Construct, Yamaha Yamalube, and a little later on, we'll be talking to Philip Binkson from uh, 24MX Honda. Well, the weather conditions here are very, very hot indeed. It's a different track to what we had on the previous two occasions that we came here. And the guys have just been out in their morning warm-up. Track starting to dry out just a little bit. And it's going to, as it does dry out, the ground is going to get very, very hard indeed. Not too dissimilar ground possibly to the, the conditions that we had in Lyon, uh, the final Grand Prix of 2014. But uh, Adam, before we talk to Julian, last week was Qatar. What were some of the standout moments for you? Maybe some of the surprises? I think it was the... Uh you know, the long-awaited debut of Ryan Villapodo in MXGP. So to see him maybe struggling a little bit, you know, with a bike, also his debut at Grand Prix and to finish seventh, eighth, top 10, lower top 10 position was the big surprise. But in MX2? MX2, Jeffrey Hurlings claimed he was 60% fit, but then still managed to win and is kind of undefeated since he's raced it. He's missed one Grand Prix, which is the Grand Prix of Mexico, where he was injured and lost that to Jordi Tixier. But apart from that, he's undefeated since the end of 2012. Well, personally, one of my surprises... Uh performances was from this guy here but before we go any further let's take a quick look at what happened one week ago in the mx2 grand prix of qatar in which this guy here julian lieber made the podium after his victory in race one jeffrey hurlings went to the line for race two full of confidence knowing that he more than likely had the fitness to make it back-to-back -back wins here in Qatar, but there's still a long way to go. And the fitness was the big question mark. Having only two weeks preparation on the machine coming into this opening round in MX2, would the bullet be able to walk away victorious with a second moto win? Well, Dylan Ferrandis, Julian Lieber, and the rest of the guys would make it difficult for him, no doubt, but it was Dylan Ferrandis on the Kawasaki who grabbed the foxhole shot on that monster energy machine, edging out Jeffrey Hurlings, putting the squeeze on the Dutchman as they went through that long sweeping left-hand turn. Hurlings though was well placed, so too was Tim Geiser. And once again, Paul's Jonas as Hurlings and Ferrandis duked it out going into turn three. Hurlings just getting the advantage over the Kawasaki rider. When in front, Hurlings set about trying to put some space between himself and Ferrandis. And he was helped by the fact that Ferrandis crashed out on lap four. And that allowed 33 Julian Lieber into second position as Pauls Jonas, number 41, and Alexander Tonkov, number 59, on the Husqvarna gave chase. Thomas Covington was well placed down in sixth position on the second of the Kawasaki's. Tonkov eventually found a way through up the inside of the Latvian Jonas. And he then went after Julian Lieber as Max Anstey did his best to fend off the challenge from Tixier, who fell once more, this time though, from sixth place. Anstey's race came to a shuddering halt as he crashed out spectacularly and would not rejoin the race as Ferrandis went back on the charge. He found a way past Valentin Guio and got himself up into fifth position, but it was another win for Jeffrey Hurlings and Red Bull KTM. I love my job. I've never could do it with my girlfriend, my team, and my parents. They always stood behind me, but not nobody. So uh, it's the first time I'm really emotional about a win, and uh, it just means so much to me because I've never been going through so, so many bad things, and uh, it's been tough, but glad to be here. Jeffrey Hurlings wins then from Julian Lieber and Dylan Ferrandis. And that's it for MX2. Well, a quick reminder then as to what happened one week ago at the MX2 Grand Prix of Qatar. And as you just saw there, Julian Lieber, the standing construct Yamaha Yamalu rider who joins me now, was on the podium with career best finishes, a third and a second last weekend. Julian, congratulations, first of all, on your podium, but uh, what a weekend, what a performance. Yeah. Were you surprised by it yourself? Yeah, for sure, I was surprised. Uh, directly the first race on the podium was, uh, I think, a surprise for the whole team. And uh, we worked hard uh, during the week, though. We had not a lot of time, and yeah, it was really cool to, to be on the podium. 
The first race, when you finished third, you found yourself closing in on Jeffrey and Dylan. <laughs> you were possibly challenging for the win at one point. Yeah, what no. What was uh, going through your mind at that at the stage of the race? Uh, I had a bit, uh, really bad start. So after one lap, I was nine, and then uh, I was closing uh, to Jeffrey and Ferrandis. And at the end, in the end, I was a bit tired, so I, I couldn't pass. And I, I, in my head, it was uh, third was a good pace, so I finished at third place. Julian, uh, one thing I think is interesting from your point of view is that you know you you've changed bikes so much in the last sort of six, seven, eight months. You know, you went from a Suzuki, jumped on a KTM with your current team. Now you changed again to the Yamaha. Um, it must have been a little bit difficult to get your head around having to work with that different machinery and get it set up right for you. Was it like that? Yeah, I mean. Uh the change on the KTM was, uh, was the most difficult because uh, the engine was really good, strong, and uh, the difference was big uh, compared to the Suzuki. And uh, when I passed from the KTM on the Yamaha, I, we rode a lot of, uh, of the standard bike during the winter because we had no parts. And, and, uh, but uh, I mean, the, the standard bike was, was already really good. So that was good, and then uh, here two two weeks uh, before Qatar, we had a really good bike, the the race bike, and uh, I mean uh, it was a little bit short to to get used to the bike, and now I have to to ride a bit with it, and I think it's going to be better after some races. In that first race, when you got third place, did you feel a little bit of pressure going into the second race, knowing that actually it's possible to finish on a podium? Yeah, th yeah, that's that's for sure. Um, I mean. Uh, I finished third. I, I, in my head, it was sure. I, I think about it to, to make a podium. But um, yeah, I just started uh, the, uh, the second race like it was the, the first race, a new race. Everything start from zero again. So uh, I, I finished two. I was really happy with that. But are we surprised that you actually finished uh, where you finished last week? Because when we look at the, the clips here from Goyas, that's when you changed machine from Suzuki yeah. to KTM and immediately from the first free practice session you were very fast. Yeah, I, I was uh, really fast uh, in the two last GPs, but uh, the physically was not, not that good. So I just uh, I made uh, always uh, 20 minutes really, really fast and then uh, and then I was tired and uh, I finished not so, so good. And then of course, you know, when you were there, you, you know, you started, like you say, you second and then uh, and led the race. But what about in Mexico, the final round? Again, another great performance, another strong performance from you. Yeah, for sure. I finished fourth in the last race. And uh, at the start, it was not that good, but I, uh, the good riders made uh, a lot of crashes in the first round. And yeah, and I managed to, to, to finish in four, and that was really cool for me, for the confidence dur during the winter. And so uh, this was a good memory. memory. Judy, you know, you're only 20 years old, yeah. right? Yes, yeah, so I mean, you've got theoretically another three seasons in MX2. Um, I know the previous year you had your knee injury and it was a difficult time for you. Many people weren't talking about you as a podium rider, you know? Yeah. It, it was almost like, uh, you know, it's one of the low points of your career so far. Do you think now you can put your name back, you know, against one of the top riders in MX2? You think, you know, you can be considered as a guy, uh, even an outside bet for the championship? I don't know. We'll see after the, after f three or five GPs. Now, now to, just to be consistent, uh, I'm not looking forward to to be uh, every weekend on the GP on the podium. But um, I want to be. I want to do uh, as much as possible top five results, and uh, then we will see you later in the championship. And what about here? Finally, um, very hot conditions. You stayed out here from Qatar, came straight to Thailand. It's a brand new track as well. So first of all, how is the track? How are the conditions? The track looks uh, is it's, uh, really good, I think. But I think they have to, to change a bit the jumps because they uh, would jump really high. But And the weather, yeah, for me, I don't like so much when it's hot. But uh, it's, it's for everybody the same, so we will see. How do you think the track will uh, kind of perform? Will it be a lot of uh, overtaking lines and things like that? I think it's going to be difficult to, to make some overtakes here. We have a nice wave se section before the end, so that be, could be uh, interesting. But I think it's going to be difficult, like, uh, like always. <laughs> All right, well, look, Julian Lieber, thanks for joining us here from uh, Standing Construct Yamaha Yamaha Lube. Um, we'll look forward to seeing his performances here this weekend, see if he can get a, re a repeat performance on the podium. But before we go any further, let's take a quick look at what happened in MXGP one week ago in Qatar.
next looking Max Nagel put on his helmet prior to the start of race two but once again just like Jeffrey Hurlings in MX2 the question marks would he be able to get off to a good start and pick up a double moto victory here at the opening round of MXGP in Qatar well Cairoli didn't make a good jump nor two did DeSalle they were squeezed to the inside and once again it was Nagel who pulled the fox hole shot Cairoli held a nice tight line that set him up perfectly for an outside sweep through turn two and that pulled him back some positions but it was Nagel once again who set the pace ahead of Gauthier Paulin, Commander de Salle, Kai Rowley and Van Horbeek with Strybos and Villapoto this time well positioned inside the top 10. Could this be the Americans race? For the first 10 laps it looked like Villapoto had the measure of the guys ahead of him, Jeremy Van Horbeek and Kevin Strybos. But it wasn't long before Roman Fevre joined the party and he found a way up the inside of the American pushing Villapoto back to 8th. Fevre then went on a charge, but couldn't do anything about Kevin Strybos, who maintained his sixth place just behind Jeremy Van Horbeek. Kenny Bobrashev was a little bit further down. He was ninth in the second race, as Dean Ferris a little bit further back, and Todd Waters, the other two Husqvarna riders, were just inside the points in 13th and 17th place. Cairoli charged onto the rear wheel of Clement de Salle in the closing stages, but that only pushed him onto the rear wheel of Gauthier Paulin. And it was a mistake from the Frenchman that eventually allowed the 25 de Salle to sneak into second position with five laps to go. De Salle then went after Max Nagel, who once again was looking confident at the head of the field, unchallenged, leading every single lap of the second race. And after holding a margin of more than five seconds, Max Nagel was able to coast to the chequered flag and record his and Husqvarna's first win of the season. This track was all about the suspension. It was so rough and so dangerous. A um, few, few moments was really tricky for, me, for myself. So I was taking it a bit more easy to don't crash. But I'm so happy and so proud for the, for the team, for my girlfriend, for myself. Everyone and I've working so hard in the winter and uh, the bike was just working awesome this, this weekend. Official confirmation then, Max Nagel, your overall winner from DeSalle, Paul and Cairoli and Van Horbeek, your top five. And a, an impressive victory for Husqvarna this weekend. And for Max Nagel, that's two wins out of the last three Grand Prix when we count back to 2014. A great start for the German. So a quick then look at what happened at Qatar one week ago in the MXGP, the opening round of the season. And I'm glad to say that we're now joined by the 24 MX Honda rider, Philip Bengtsson. Uh, he was new to the World Championship last year, showed up in a few rounds, few races here and there, put in some impressive performance, which we will talk about a little later on. But um, first of all, I guess we should say welcome to MXGP full time and yeah. uh, with Honda. Thank you very much. Uh, how's it been so far? How was last week in Qatar? Uh, it was not so good. I was struggling a lot. Uh, the track was really sketchy and uh, I didn't get comfortable, so yeah. What was, what was the problem there then? Just the nature of the ground or the fact that it was racing at night? Because it was the first time there for you as well, I believe. Yeah, I was struggling a little bit with the lights and also the track was really hard underneath and then you have the, like, the soft on top, uh, so yeah. You moved up from, uh, you rode a 350 last year, Philip, yeah. now you're on a 450. Um, you know, was that, also was your first kind of GP on that bigger bike, was that kind of a factor? I mean, yeah. how was it changing up? Yeah, it was. Uh, like the 450 has a lot of torque and a lot of bottom power, and the 350 has like less bottom and a lot of top. So uh, yeah, I was also struggling a bit with that. So I mean, did you need a bit of time in the winter to get used to it, or you know, how, how did it work with the team and the way you developed the Honda? Uh, we started in the sand, obviously, so uh, <laughs> and uh, I liked it a lot already from the beginning, but uh, on the hard pack, uh, I still have good to uh, get used to it. Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I heard that you were training with Harry Everts last year. You yep. were linking up. Well, are you still working with him, or you know, what, what did he do for you last year that helped you step up a level? Yeah, I went to his uh, training school in Spain, uh, and after that, we continued to work during the season. Uh, and uh, he made some like uh, riding schedules for me that I followed, and uh, yeah, he was there on the on the GPs to give some tips. But uh, yeah, he's working with KTM and now I'm with Honda, so 
But so obviously you're not working with him now, but I guess you're still following riding schedules that he maybe laid out for you last year, or, or has it changed now because you're at Honda? No, no, no. I I st still like follow that schedules a little bit, but uh, yeah, also do do some new things now. So. Well, when we saw you last year, uh, you rode as a wild card in Finland. It was a great GP, 11th overall, but um, I think it was sixth position. Um, in, in race two, I think it was. Oh, you had a great position. Well, you started sixth and finished in, in 14th, but you were riding top 10 for yeah. much of both the races. Um, what were you feeling at that moment in time? Because the last time we'd seen you at the circuits was when you were riding European 250, and that was a couple of years before. So, you know, it was, uh, it was strange to see you on the big bike for a start. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, uh, I really liked the track there in, in Finland. When I went out, uh, immediately I felt comfortable and... Uh, it's really similar to, to a track that uh, I have close to my house in, in Sweden, so um, I think it was faster in time practice and then six in the quali race. Uh, and then I made great starts and then uh, I was just following the, following the leaders. And obviously this is part of the, the, ra the race here that we have on screen, but it's, um, it's not the biggest track, it's quite tight, but it does get very bumpy and we're, we're assuming that you prefer sandy conditions to, to hard pack. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do, I do. Uh, I like tracks like Valkenswald or yeah, like Finland. What was it like that weekend though, running up front for as long as you did in the in those first few races? Were you surprised? Yeah, of of course I was a bit surprised, but uh, like I said, I had a really good feeling immediately when I went out on the track and then uh, got some confidence from uh, being fastest in both the practice and then the pre qualifying. So. What about, you know, Sweden? I mean, we were talking about this the other night, Paul, and we were trying to remember the last time we had a Swedish ride up on the podium. I think it might have been Johnny Lynn, like in the 500cc days, the beginning of the century. I mean, that's a long time ago now. Is there, yeah. do you get like Swedish fans, you know, sending you messages? Is there like a little bit of a build up in the media there? Uh, is, uh, are people kind of pushing you? Because I guess, you know, there's a country of a lot of tradition in the sport. Y yeah, of course. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, Swedish guy now, guys now that uh, is pushing and uh, like uh, sending messages and all that kind of stuff, so. It's it's really fun to see. What do you what do you know about the history of the Swedish? Uh, obviously, we know Carl Quist yeah, uh, as a world Christ, champion. Yeah. But what about after that? Uh, Who are the guys that you kind of remember? I know Jonny Linde really well. Okay. Um, yeah, and the rest I don't really know that much. We had uh, Jorgen Nilsson and uh, Markus Hansson yeah. was world the last world champ. Nineteen ninety four. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember. <laughs> but uh, and what about when we went to? Um, I think it was Lommel, wasn't it, um, when you led the race? Yeah, um, second race. Yeah, you led the second race there. You made a great start, obviously, leading. Yeah, yeah. The guy behind you just happens to be Tony Cairoli yeah. on his <laughs> way to world title number eight. When you look behind you and see the 2-2-2 two, two, two on, that, on that KTM, what goes through your mind at that stage on lap one or lap two? Uh, it was fun because I was a bit on the outside and then uh, I was stuck in thirds. So I was on the rev limit of the whole corner and then uh, when I got over the first jump, I realized I was first. Uh, and then I was thinking, uh, now I go to the finish line because then they're going to be 664 on the first lap. So uh, <laughs> I thought they were going to pass me <coughs> immediately, but nobody came. So I was, I just went for it uh, as long as possible. But you rode, I mean, Adam, he rode awesome there, didn't he? Yeah. All through the practice. I think you were fastest in the first pre-practice, weren't you? I uh, think, or was that in Finland? Third, I think. Okay. That was in Finland. Yeah, yeah. okay. But uh, in terms of the, the overall Grand Prix itself, um, different changes in, in conditions there. The first one was dry, the second one was wet. I guess yeah. you preferred the, uh, the one where you had the better result. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and what about this weekend? First time here? Yeah, first time here. Uh, in yeah. fact, I spoke to him uh, a couple of days ago when we went to the, uh, the official dinner on, on, on Thursday evening. And um, I could see he was trying to keep nice and cool. <laughs> and I said, first time here, yep. Is it hotter than you thought it would be? Yes, <laughs> because you cannot see that from the TV when we broadcast the images live no. you know, when you're watching our home. No, like immediately when you step out of the airplane, it's like a going into a wall, like boom, so humid. Yeah. It's not super hot now because we have the wind also, but still it's really humid, so. Well, actually, just leading on from a question, I'm curious, Philip, because uh, Paul asked you how it felt to lead that Grand Prix. How does it feel to be full-time part of MXGP? I mean, you're not trying to push your way up through MX2. You're in the in the Premier class. You know, you're with a, a riders with many riders with Grand Prix winning experience and podium experience. Yeah. I mean, when you're there on the gate and you kind of look to your left and you might see your Ryan Villapoto and you look to your right and you see factory Yamahas, Hondas, Kawasaki's, 
you know, it must, uh, you need some kind of little mental strength, well, you know, to get through that, I yeah. imagine. Yeah, yeah, of course. Like you said, you look to the right and there's Villa Porto and then uh, you have Cairoli and all the other guys. Uh, I think we counted the other day and so we had like 18 GB winners, like past GB winners. So it's not easy to come like I did last year, only do four races and then straight into to a full series. So. How have you been settling into the team then? Because um, last year, very much a privateer, and now you're part of a, a, a team, a lot of backing from Honda. Um, and yeah. this team has been around quite a few years, even if it wasn't 24MX initially when it was LS Honda. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's still the same team in, in, in that respect. But obviously they have a lot of experience. Yeah. They finished third in the World Championship with Commander Sal a few years back. But is there any pressure on you to have to do well or how are they looking at you? How are you looking at this season first time uh, as a full time MXGP rider? Uh, no, there's not not uh, really any pressure from the team since uh, I didn't do that many rounds last year. I think the pressure is more on uh, maybe on Christoph. Um, so, yeah, they just want me to 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 build slowly and not go bananas in the first race and crash out and be out for the whole season. Uh, uh, for me, it's just going to be baby steps the, the whole season and uh, try to shine maybe in uh, yeah, where I feel comfortable, like in Valkensvar or yeah, Lommel or whatever. And how do you get on with Christoph Charlier, your teammate? Yeah, we get along long good. Uh, he, he's not speaking that much English, but uh, yeah. And I live in uh, Holland and he lives in Corsica. So we don't spend that much time together. So I do my thing and he do his thing. All right. And then lastly, how do you kind of see Udavala? You know, we've been to Sweden every year, you know, even since I've been working in Grand Prix. Yeah. So it's uh, it's like a staple part of the of the Grand Prix scene. Um, you know, how kind of, how do you see the track and the way that event's evolved? I mean, the, the crowds have kind of gone up and down a little bit. It seems to be, Sweden need a top GP rider, don't they? Yeah, it's going to be fun to come there, come there this year. Uh, last year I also went there, but then I only did Valgesvart before, so I was not that prepared and it's not really my favorite track either but uh, uh, it's fun with all the Swedish spectators and uh, hope there's going to be even more this year. And just going back to Qatar just a week ago obviously completely different conditions to what we had here we as we mentioned a moment ago a night race uh, also a little bit cooler. Um, what was the experience like for you? I know you said that you struggled with the lights and the circuit but was it kind of what you expected uh, from a night race or not really? Um, not not really. I didn't expect to struggle that much with the with the lights, but uh, I guess it's the same for everybody. But maybe a small advantage if, if you have been there before, then you know a little bit more to yeah what to expect. Talking about Ryan Villapoto, obviously there's been a lot of hype both sides of the Atlantic in terms of is he going to win? Is Tony going to win? Were you surprised at his performance last week? And if you were, do you expect that to change this weekend? Yeah, I was ap actually happy to see him uh, struggle a little bit because then I could say that uh, if you've not been there before, you were struggling a bit. So, uh, but he was so fast now in the free practice here, so uh, I think he's gonna be fine. Yeah, more than fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, obviously uh, we wish you all the best. So, uh <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Philip Bengtsson, thank you for joining us here on the uh, 24MX Honda. Wish you all the best for this weekend and, of course, for the rest of the season. Well, um, we'll let Philip disappear and we'll talk about the competition in just a moment. And then when we come back from that, I'll spend a little bit more time talking to Adam Wheeler. So competition time then, folks, once again. Don't forget... In our competition, as it was last week, take a picture at any MX Grand Prix race showing the Athena or Get logo. Upload the pic with the hashtag MXGP or hashtag Athena Live on MXGP Facebook page. And the most voted pic at the end of race day will win an RIG 900 OGO bag. Uh, and you'll proceed to the next step in the competition. The top three during the race season will qualify for the 2015 Athena photo competition. And after the MXON, which this year is in France. The finalists will go head to head to win more fantastic prizes. So obviously all the best with that. Good luck. And who knows, we might even see some budding photographers out there at the same time. And you may even be able to get yourself uh, in a media center, who knows? But uh, that could be uh, a little bit further down the line. But our final guest, uh, and I'm back here with Adam Wheeler. So uh, Adam, obviously two interesting guests there. Julian Lieber, um, obviously surprised to be on the podium last week. What did you make of his performance a week ago in Qatar in MX2? I think uh, his bright starts helped Paul, as we saw in Mexico and Brazil at the end of last year. You know, he's uh, such a, a stylish little rider. Um, you know, he's not the biggest guy on the bike, but uh, he rides it really well, that Yamaha. And I think, you know, he was a bit of a shock for the team uh, with Valentin Guillaume also there. It's a, sta it's a strong 
crew they've got there at Standing Construct. So Julian Eber taking a podium first time out. I just hope for him it's not going to be a case of scoring a goal in the first two or three minutes of the match. You know, I think he'll actually use this and push on and get further good results. I hope so, because we, it's always good to see, you know, a rider who's been there for a couple of years, but then, you know, pushing up and developing, you know, not someone who's stuck in a rut. He had that bad in knee injury, missed half a season. Mm. And now he's, uh, he's, he's actually proved he's got the goods to running Grand Prix at the top. And the good thing, and the good thing there is, when he got on that standing construct KTM, the last two rounds of uh, 2014, last year, Yes, he was quick on it, but he was quick on a KTM. It's good to see that they've done their homework down at Standing. They've provided a bike with him that he can, and Valentin Guio, his teammate, of course, that he seemingly can, can stand on the podium, but possibly even challenge for race wins. So they've not lost anything in that change of team because that was probably the biggest surprise, wasn't it, in the off-season. They go from KTM, get a winning package almost, podiums with Valentin, and then suddenly it's like all change. Yeah, it's just making the most of that new Yamaha as well, Paul. You know, he took victory in the Grand Prix of Belgium last year, Max Anstey. Um, so they've changed the machinery, and I think when they really get, you know, in tune with it, it took, they had a couple of delays, like he said. So uh, I think once, you know, the, the team are completely familiar with those motorcycles and they got the best out of them, then you'll see both of those riders pushing for podiums frequently. And uh, before we talk um, about the, the main players from last week in both classes, uh, just real quickly, Philip Bengtsson. Um, good to see him getting a full-time ride, isn't it? You don't see too many privateers getting in in a wild card ride, ride and then going on to, to land a ride with a, with a major team. That's right, and also a Swede. You know, yeah. we, we, you know, it's good to have that kind of wide demographic in the Premier class. And I think uh, you know, he, he's a tidy rider as well, looks great on the bike when you see him riding around. And I just hope you know, he doesn't get crushed by that little weight of expectation you know, as, a, as a Honda Motor Europe supported team you know, to deliver results. I think he does need a good season at this level just to establish himself and learn everything. Yeah. Well, a week ago it was the MXGP of Qatar, the opening round. We're going to talk MXGP riders now. Of course, the surprise for everybody was that, you know, and obviously we want him to do well coming over here as, a, as an import, the American Ryan Villapoto. It wasn't his weekend last weekend, obviously stalled on the line for whatever reason in the first race. Uh, the second race, he started in seventh, got passed by Fevre, that turned out to be a back brake problem, apparently. So, um, but it's the first round, and we said that in commentary, you know, w we weren't expecting him to come and, and wipe the floor with everybody, but I tell you what, he certainly looks comfortable here today, doesn't he? Yeah, I think it was 1.8 seconds ahead of the second place rider, yeah. so what do you reckon, Paul? I mean, is he going to be back this weekend? I mean, it's a very kind of jumpy track, it's very small, only a 135 lap time, so yeah. it's a different kettle of fish compared to Qatar, isn't it? It is, and I, we were talking in the press room yesterday, and I got my podium, any order, Ryan Villapoto, Tony Cairoli, possibly Paul Ann, as, a as the three guys, and I think maybe De Salle has also got to look so in there. So you, you're completely writing off Max Anstey, who took, yeah, Max Anstey. Uh, Max, Max Nagel, Nagel took uh, victory no, last week. No, not necessarily. Uh, I think what he did was great on the Husqvarna, but at the same time, I know he had his problems at the Saxon Ring uh, a couple of years ago with the heat when he was riding Honda, but he was sick that day. So if he does, you know, struggle with the heat here, then obviously that's going to be his downfall. Um, but I just think Tony, who's won the last four races in Thailand, obviously doesn't struggle in the heat. Paul Ann has been on the podium here, DeSalle's been on the podium here, but the guy that's obviously new to it all, who's no stranger to riding in the heat and humid conditions, is Ryan Villapoto. So yeah. that's where I get my uh, my top three guys from. And Tyler Rache was saying yesterday that this heat, and it was hotter yesterday than it is today, the heat here is nothing compared to when they're training in Florida, where they're running from air conditioning rooms to the bike, and, you know, vice versa. So. Yeah, I think it's the it's a good timing for Ryan Villapoto to deliver. Uh, it's a good little kind of new, I don't want to say supercross, but jumpy kind of track. Uh, temperatures that they're used to. Also, this will favour Todd Waters from Australia and the Red Bull Spawn Husqvarna team. So, I, I don't know. It's looking good for him so far, isn't it? It is, and I I think the the nature of the track is possibly going to lend to some great racing because of the nature of it. It's tight, it's twisty, it's jumpy. Um, those with good skills, good technique, will be the ones that uh, you know stand on the top step of the podium, or will get the results. It's also worth knowing that there's a, a very long start straight here, uh, 110 meters, which is actually pretty lengthy for MSGP. Into a 170 degree first turn as well, so it's a right-handed turn. So the guys are going to be braking before they get to the turn, um, and then they're having to put their foot down. So we might see some carnage there. Problems, you think? Possibly, but uh, we'll know more in the qualifying races a little bit later on. But unfortunately, that's all we've got time for here this weekend from Thailand. Our 
second MXGP studio show of the season. But uh, thanks to my guest, Julian Lieber from Standing Construct Yamaha Yamaha Loop. Of course, uh, Philip Bengtson, 24 MX Honda Racing. And of course, Adam Wheeler as well, once again, on trackoffroad.com. Well, that's it, as we said, but join us for the racing live tomorrow, wherever you can, mxgptv.com or anywhere else where you happen to be watching it in the world. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in about three weeks' time when we go to Argentina. See you then. Bye for now.